Welcome to another edition of Yacht Crew Vlogs right here on Yachting International Radio. My name is Ria. I am your host, and I'm very pleased to welcome my next guest. Her name is Jenny Johnson. She is the founder and CEO of Maritime Inclusion Partners. How are you, Jenny? I'm well, Ria. How are you? Good, thanks. We are currently seeing diversity, inclusion, equality being talked about throughout the entire maritime sector. Tell us a little bit about yourself first. What is your background and what brought you to where you are today? Sure. Well, thank you for inviting me on today. I'm really excited to be here. As you said, my name is Jenny Johnson. I am a cisgender female. I use she, her pronouns. I am a former mariner and an independent consultant for the Maritime Inclusion Partners, which is a company that I launched in early 2023. I have a roughly 20, 25 years experience in the maritime industry, both at sea and on shore. I bounced around a lot as a mariner. So I've worked on small passenger dinner boats, small passenger cruise boats, yachts, research vessels, tanker vessels, and ammo ships, a little bit of everything kind of across the board. And so I have a unique experience. I was also most of the time in a rated position or an unlicensed position as an AB uh, or an engineer. I have some time as a limited mate, a limited captain. And then shoreside working really focused on mariner recruiting, as well as some DEI work and culture work. And I live in Jacksonville, Florida now, but I was actually raised in the Pacific Northwest in the United States. And I live here with my husband and my son. Why is it the maritime industry seems like it's two decades, three decades behind everyone else when everyone else is still behind where they should be? Yeah, it's a good question. I always tell people that the maritime industry, especially when I'm speaking to someone who's not familiar with it, is stuck in 1955. And they all think they're Marlon Brando on the waterfront, right? There is this... Because of the traditions of the industry, when you when the lines are cast off, there's no social justice on board, right? There's no hashtag Me Too. There's no hashtag Black Lives Matter. It all falls into this, the hierarchy of things. And I joke, I'm like, you don't, it's not a democracy. You don't vote where you pull in next. Like everything, everyone kind of falls into their place. And... It's very comfortable. And while there needs to be somebody in charge, right? I totally agree. There can't be flat and there needs to be a hierarchy. There's a lot of things that are still in place today that really don't need to be. I had somebody, a friend of mine one time who was not from the military or the maritime industry, and she had visited one of the ships and she came back and she says, why do they eat separately? Why is there a crew eating area and an officer eating area? And I was like, uh, tradition? She goes, well, I think that's weird. Or is someone better than somebody else? Like they should be able to just eat together. And that was like a smack in the face. I was like, you are absolutely right. Like this is continuing to foster this archaic and antiquated way that this industry culture runs itself. And so those are tiny little things that could change that would help bring the industry up a couple of decades. But I think also the pure invisibility of the maritime industry and how people around the world really don't have a concept of how they get their stuff and that most of it had to go on a ship somewhere. That is total public awareness, a lack of public awareness I think is what continues to perpetuate things. Nobody's paying attention to what's happening on board those ships. So that's what I think has kept us so far behind on a lot of these issues. The captain is ultimately responsible for every soul on board. So to have a captain separate from the crew so that they don't get to the stage where they're like drinking buddies, I can understand that to a certain degree. The problem that comes in it for me is that the buildups throughout the career, creating that career is not an equal opportunity chance. It just isn't. It is very male orientated. It's very white male orientated. You see these men that even if they are not fit to be in control of that many souls on board, 
they still are in that position because of their network, because of nepotism, whatever. It's time that we change that. People get to where they are based on their education, based on their credentials, based on their ability to do the job. And if you are not capable of doing that job, whether you've been found guilty of a crime, whether you have tested for alcohol or for cocaine or for any other drug, you should lose your ability to be a captain and lose your ability to be at sea. No, absolutely. And that is the nepotism and favoritism and all of that is definitely runs rampant within the industry and people referring people because they knew them from school or whatever. And I definitely talk to organizations a lot about like wrangling, who's making the hiring, firing and promotion decisions. Do you, does the organization really know who's doing that, right? So if you're allowing it to happen at an operational level, is anyone from HR having any oversight into how that's being done? Or are you just allowing the subject matter experts to make those decisions because you don't, you're not familiar with the industry. So you know, when you're looking at a captain resume, you really don't know what the hell you're looking at, right? So I, I think that there's a lot of, because our industry is, is so exclusive and we tend to make people feel non-maritime people do not feel welcome in the space of a bunch of mariners. They just don't. There's all of these acronyms and the sea stories and the private jokes. And when you're coming in from not that space, you're just like, I don't fit in here. And so I can see where organizations default to allow the operational people to make those hiring, firing, and promotion decisions without having any oversight or any intervention to look for discrimination and favoritism and nepotism. And we also you run into issues where, along with a mariner's resume, is usually their mariner credential and their passport and all that kind of stuff. And so hire people that are doing these hiring decisions are seeing their gender, their birth date, their picture, like before they even have a, even a chance to interview somebody. And so really companies don't even have a leg to stand on to defend themselves if somebody went back and said, you didn't hire me because of my age or because of where I live or whatever, right? And so that's definitely a huge gap within the industry is, is that checks and balances when it comes to who's making those hires. And so, yeah, we kind of default to the same kind of white hetero male person. And when those relationships have been formed between captains and the company and all that kind of stuff, they really act like they're just irreplaceable. And so this whole concept of going, well, look, you were, we know that you were drunk or you have sexual misconduct charges against you. It's companies were like, oh, I can't let go of a good captain. It's the best captain we've ever had. So I can't, let's figure out a different way. And so those are all things that need to be exposed and brought to the surface and new processes put into place, right? I understand where the company is at. They're there to make money, right? I'm not trying to take that away from them, but it's like, why does it have to be status quo? Well, let's acknowledge that you're frozen in time because you don't know how to get around this problem. And let's bring in people who can help you get around this problem so we can make the industry just a better place for everybody. I know that in the yachting industry, that there is no requirement for anybody to have a criminal record check. Is there a criminal record check requirement within the wider maritime industry? So you, for the U.S. Coast Guard, you do get a background check for your initial issuing of your credential. And then we have our now, nowadays, back in the day, we didn't have this transportation workers identification credential. But now we have that additional credential that is every five years that gets screened when you renew. It does, none of these processes include a sex offender registry or anything like that. And so even though you're getting that background, it's not going to flag you if you've had any sexual misconduct uh, senses. So that's a huge gap that everyone's just standing in right now because we're unsure about how to get past that and fix that hole. Because in the U.S., there is no such thing as a national sex offender registry, which was news to me. I thought that there was. Turns out because each state has different definitions of 
rape and molestation and all of these things, they can't have one at a national level. So it's an individual state, sometimes county, sometimes city. And so it would, it's right now, logistically, system it's very difficult for them to capture that. But I'm, I continue to bring the topic up and the point up because that absolutely needs to be something that happens. Some people need to go through a, that screening to get a credential. And there needs to be repetitive screenings of a sex offender registry before anybody steps back out onto a vessel in close quarters environment, remote environment out at sea. It's, it's, it is so elementary to me that that should be the bare minimum. And yet it seems to be the biggest hill to climb. I have to laugh because I can imagine that any of these people, if the teacher in their kid's school was found guilty of pedophilia and molesting a child. And that teacher, a couple of days later, walked back into that class to teach four-year-old little Sally again. I mean, right. you don't let pedophilias back into a classroom to teach your kids. Why the hell no. would you allow someone yeah. back on board a vessel that is going to be isolated in the middle of nowhere for days, months on end, around somebody that he has the potential to criminally offend against? Or she, for that matter. Exactly. And it's everybody's really hunkered down around this innocent until proven guilty. And while I get that, and that is how things are supposed to work, let's put in a gap. Let's put in a safety net where there's a suspension. There's something there where somebody cannot go back into an environment where they are able to ascend and really have their victims are isolated. They have a captive audience. They have nowhere to go. And when I explain to people, so it's, it, it, as cases come out and people want my, well, why didn't they, why didn't they report or why didn't they say something or why didn't they this and that? And I'm just like, look, I have been the only on a ship lots of times. I have been assaulted twice at sea. I never reported anything to anybody. The idea that you can sometimes can't get more than 700 feet away from this person that has done this to you. And you have to share your meals with them or work alongside them all day. And understanding what happens when somebody's been through trauma and the brain and the decision making and all of that. It's so easy to like Monday morning quarterback that kind of stuff. Well, I would say something you don't know. You don't know what you would do unless you're in that situation. Not um, only that, it, history shows that if you're reporting a senior officer or somebody senior mm -hmm. to you, the likelihood that either you'll get fired or she will get a slap on the wrist and come back a couple of weeks later angry as a hornet and take out his anger on you, even worse. Yeah, there's too much fear. There's too much, there's so much risk. And in, in saying something with the current state of things and knowing that you, there's so many instances where the person who's accusing, of, it, it has to be removed. Like they're being removed from the vessel instead of the other person being removed from the vessel. I've heard that story once, I've heard it a thousand times. And it's, you know, that there's already all this stigma and now you're going to make this person under a spotlight even more by making them be the one to leave. And then everyone's going to talk. And then the captains talk, oh, we don't want this person because this is what it is that the whole game of telephone and all the scuttlebutt that goes around, it all needs to be wrangled in. And right now, so many mariners are like, we just don't want any women on board or we just don't want that. It's just not, no cadets, nothing. Everything's just, instead of being able to control themselves, and yeah. change who they are. Like they're not, they are, they're basically saying they're incapable of speaking professionally to people with dignity. They are capable of keeping their hands to themselves. Are you kidding me right now? And companies are capable. So that seems to be the that. accepted culture in all maritime. Yes. It's accepted. Exactly. Nobody it calls is. out bad behavior. Let me ask you, I know that in yachting, there's been for four years now, forum after forum, people shouting and crying about the fact that there's absolutely no crew coming into the industry and crew retention is becoming absolutely impossible. Are you finding that in the wider maritime industry as well? Correct. Yeah. Across the board. A hundred percent. And the reasons vary, but I think that 
because the industry, like I said, is so it's so archaic and antiquated that these long, super long hitches at sea and making that kind of dedication, people really aren't interested in doing that anymore in general. There are people that want to go and just be gone, but I'm just saying for creating that work-life balance, these next generations of workers coming up, they're just, they're far more focused on people, purpose, planet, and wanting to have a life and have a career that they believe in. And so this kind of like mindless joining a ship for eight or nine months and just being treated however is not really their deal anymore. And I've proposed to multiple times that the industry needs to change the shipping rules, as they say, right? And again, all my suggestions cost money. I understand that all the things that I want to do cost money, but shortening those hitches, right? Where people could still do deep sea work, but not necessarily for five, six months, seven months, eight, nine months at a time and making that kind of stuff more appealing. The other thing that we would need to see, especially here in the U.S., is like, a, like the universal industry-wide family planning benefits, right? And there's, unless an individual organization decides that they want to pay for a month of paternity leave or maternity leave or whatever, people are just like on their own. So we lose so many people at that critical five, six year mark because they've decided to start a family and companies are just, ah, or good luck. And now here we are, we're sitting here where people want more out of life. They want to have families. They want to feel connected to the organization they work for. They want to know, they want to feel like they're doing good for the planet and for their fellow humans. And let's face it, because the industry is talking 1955, when you get on board a commercial vessel, especially, and you're sitting there listening to the way people speak to each other and go out, know, I think this is right. Maybe work rest hours aren't being abided by, whatever it is, this next generation is not happening. They're like, I want to have peace of mind and I want to feel good about what I'm doing and I'm not going to let you kick me around and I'm not going to sit here and watch you kick other people around. And so they're just losing interest altogether. Do you think part of it is because of the financial disparity? 20 years ago, if you were going to see, you knew you were going to get paid really good money and you didn't actually have to put a lot of money out in order to go to sea. But when we talk about the nature of the maritime industry not having moved much further than 1955, I can tell you that the wages haven't moved that far from 1955. Well, that's not necessarily true, but when you take into account the cost of living, inflation, the way the world works today, but the cost to become a mariner have increased exponentially. Uh, even 20 years ago, 15 years ago, when I started covering the maritime industry, you could probably get yourself on board some form of vessel for under a thousand euros. And yeah. today's day and age, the cost has risen to the state where in some places with less than 10,000 euros in your pocket, you're never getting on any ship anywhere, anyhow, but yet the wages are still the same as they were when you only had to pay a thousand. Is that the same as the rest of the maritime? Yeah, at least definitely within the US. I think my first issue, my my credential was $90 and that got me any job that I really wanted to be as a deck hand or as a entry level position on any vessel. And I started in prior to SCCW 95 and so I was Several. Well, I was probably three years in before before I took my first basic safety training course that was funded when I was working on a yacht in California, and it was funded by the boat owner. And so I have no idea what it costs for us to do that at that time. But I love the concept of basic safety training. I love the idea that you can go on any vessel anywhere, speaking any language, and we all know what happened. We all know what to do. If there's fire, if there's man overboard, like. We all can go and do the same thing. And I love that. But the all the other things that have been added on over the last 20 years and all of these schools that have popped up that may or may not be legit. I have definitely heard of lots of predatory maritime training schools that people go, oh, okay, I'm going to give you my $5,000. And turns out none of the training is certified by Coast Guard. You can't turn in any of the certificates. Um, 
And so navigating that process and then also understanding like, where is the line and stop? Like looking at your trajectory, like which way do you want to go and how high do you want to go and be like current state? You can't sit there and go, okay, I need 60 grand to do this. You can't because halfway through whatever you're trying to do, Coast Guard's going to be like, oh, wait, we've added this and this and that. And now it's, you can't, you'll never catch it. And it's made it to where you go to a four-year academy or you don't do anything. And that is, in lies all of the inequities that we suffer and the obstacles that are in place for underrepresented communities to be able to get into this industry. Let's do something that is going to help all these individuals that cannot go to college, but want to go to sea and could be a worker like tomorrow on board these vessels. If we're able to invest in them a little bit, let's continue to support them so that they can become an officer and flourish. Well, it almost seems like an oxymoron. You've made it so expensive to get into the industry that you have to be of a certain income level to even go to sea, but the kind of jobs in general that most people are, I don't care whether you're on a super yacht, when you get on board, you're either scrubbing a toilet with a toothbrush or you're swabbing the deck or having night watch. None of these jobs are glamorous. So what you're saying is we priced it to the point where you have to come from an upper middle class family to get into seafaring, but if you come from an upper middle class family, there is no way on God's green earth you're going to be willing to do the grunt work that is expected when you first start in the maritime industry. So, of course, you can't find crew. And they've done it no. themselves. You're 100% correct because it's definitely the maritime colleges here in the US are cranking out plenty of officers. There's only one federal academy, which is technically free to go to. The other six are full-on state four-year colleges, universities, and have the same price tag that goes with them. And even the federal academy, I always, I joke, I'm like, you need a letter from a senator recommending you to this school. I said, I don't even know how to get that. I don't know how I would do that. And so there are obstacles to even get into that only a certain demographic of Americans would even know how to navigate. So there's that, but then yeah, just to pay for this school, um, there's the their cadet shipping costs. They have to pay to go out on the training ships. Those are not included in their tuition. And some of the schools are as much as like 16,000 US dollars for one summer to go out on the training ship. And if you don't have those sea days, then you can't, you can't graduate. And so that's why going with a company who's going to pay you a tiny little safe in a day, like an intern to go out on a commercial vessel is far more appealing because you don't pay for it and get to go. But we have so few operators now that are willing to take on cadets because they look at them as a risk and the mariners don't want them because they don't want to be accused of sexual misconduct and it didn't end up in the news. And so there's like a ton of things. And then you're right for the pay. I, it's all over the board, depending on what kind of work you're doing and where you're doing it. But unless you're at that kind of junior officer level where you've gone into that university and been able to do that, you're not going to be making a ton of money for the kind of work that is going to be required of you. It's a very, very grungy, labor intensive sort of work. And you're away from home that is still very scarce within the U.S. flag vessels. So that kind of quality of life thing is still working on it. There's a lot of discussion that's getting better, but I feel like that's really far behind. I've forgotten about the Mariner as a person and how to meet them at their basic human needs so that they want to continue to be Mariner. Well, I think it all comes down to human rights and I think it all comes down to fair pay and fair treatment. And until the industry changes the way it looks at crew, and elevates crew back to the status that they used to be elevated at years ago, you're going to see any vessel on the water is going to be lacking crew until the attitude changes, until they realize that there is something definitely wrong with the way the system has worked for so long. And it is time for a change because it's a brand new world. It's a new generation. 90% of the world's goods are shipped <laughs> across sea. So it might come down to the fact that one day some senator 
or some queen or king of some country wakes up and can't get your article it was that they really wanted from the other side of the world and goes, well, why can't I have it? Well, because you don't have any seafarers anymore because nobody wanted to pay them. So it's just not possible. Is that going to be the time that people wake up? It should be. You would think that would be it, but I would have hoped that somehow it would happen before that. It's there's um, There has to be something. There has to be some... And it's like twofold, right? It's education, but on like from about two levels, right? So it, yes, this is how we get our stuff. Let's explain to you how the world works and how commerce works. Let's try to get your thing. But then also too, let's talk about the cost of not having inclusive environments on board our vessels, the cost of not being appealing to women, people of color, LGBTQ. Let's look at that and realize where we're going to land because we are alienating giant demographics of people that- I think we're alienating like literally 90% of the population. Yes, and could come in and save us, to be honest. I believe that there is so much innovation and ingenuity and brilliance out there just waiting to be tapped that could completely transform the maritime industry if we were willing to change our culture and not we need to move from tolerance to celebration we need to move away from well i'm gonna just People like, we need to respect each other. And I take issue with that because I feel like people hide behind that word respect because I think it means different things to different people. And respect from one person can just say, well, I'm not out and out saying racial slurs to you. So therefore I'm showing you respect. It's about celebrating the differences that everybody brings to the table. And that's, we're stuck in this, this yeah, golden rule slash respect thing that without perspective and without empathy, the whole golden rule thing's out the window. We don't know what we want. We don't know what it's like to be someone of those groups. And so how can we even for a second act like, well, just treat, just treat me the way I want to, I'm gonna treat you the way I want to be treated. I don't know what it's like to be them. And yeah. so education, perspective, empathy, and then celebrating. And then you know what? If you're a person who can't get on with that and can't see that and can't see people for the humanity that they bring, then maybe this isn't the industry for you. And you can go be a curmudgeon somewhere and live on a mountain. I don't care. I don't care. Just go. <laughs> we don't need you. Because there's a lot of people who are out in this industry today who identify with these communities and they're scared. They're scared to be who they are at work. There's far more than we ever can even probably tally that are being put through so much harassment and so much negativity, even though the people around them don't know that they're doing it, right? There, there's transgender mariners out there that are sitting there surrounded by all kinds of nasty, misogyny, sexist, derogatory terms. And they're just sitting there going, these people don't know what I am. And so I'm just gonna sit here and suffer in the mental toll on that. Having been the person who was on the receiving end of, I know what they were trying to do to me, the conversations or things that were happening around me. I know that they were coming after me because I was obviously sitting there as a woman. And so they knew, but you know, that was mental toll enough on me, but just imagine being someone who you just can't even be yourself. You're just being completely inauthentic every day of your life. You're acting all the time for survival because you're out in the middle of the Indian ocean with 24 people who clearly would cause you bodily harm if they found out that you were any part of the LGBTQ community. Jenny, if somebody is looking to hire your company, what can they expect? Maritime Inclusion Partners, what is it exactly that you do? So what we do is very individualized to each organization. And so depending on where they, if they have an immediate crisis, I've had some companies come to me that had like an immediate, very specific, the thick conflict that they were looking to have handled. I have people coming to me for general DEI training, but it's always a maritime focus. We also are able to come on board and do vessel assessments. We can do crew assessments and get an idea of whether or not there's any cultural culture issues on board and pro provide a strategy around how an organization can improve on that. 
We also offer NBAR services. So if a company is looking to get cleared through the Maritime Administration to take on cadets, but the program items that they need to do is more than what they're able to provide internally. Some of those items like the check-ins, cadets have to call and do check-ins throughout their cruise. There's pre-boarding webinars. I have vast experience running cadet shipping programs and also running the MBARC program. And so we're able to take that on too, if somebody wants help with that. And then also providing workforce development support. So if organizations are feeling like they want to get the word out about the industry, they're not really sure how to do it. I offer those services where I can go out into the communities, offer my story, and be on the platform of how to become a U.S. Mariner and help people through that. So if companies are like, we don't, we can't hire a whole team to go out and do this, can we contract somebody to go to this event or go over here and really get that kind of grassroots conversation going about becoming a Mariner? So it's really across the board, anything regarding vessel DEI, culture, Mariner workforce development, also happy to do speaking engagements, moderating panels, being a panelist, I've experienced doing all of those. And yeah, I just really want to make the industry better for everybody, more diverse, more inclusive, so that we can, the industry can continue to, to thrive, be successful and be better than it's ever been. Now, are you available around the world as well? It's not just the United States. I can be available around the world. So right now, most of my networking is within the United States, but there is definitely some interest from other areas around the world. And so I think that we would be open to that expansion and doing that kind of work anywhere where it's needed. And I think that we're probably really needed everywhere. So yeah, I think we will expand to that. Jenny, I have to say thank you ever so much. It's very refreshing to speak to somebody who isn't afraid to say things the way they see them. Yes, yeah, it's the same to you. Like I, when we were speaking, I'm just like, it's, I do often feel like the only loud voice in the room sometimes. And I, nobody ever stops me and says that I'm wrong. I know that what I'm saying is right and it needs to be told, but it is very, it's wonderful to chat with a like-minded person like yourself and be able to share. And you know, I always joke about, well, we're just solving the world's problems, one conversation at a time. And I think that's important to, for people set, that have that kind of voice to connect because there's definitely power in numbers. There definitely is. And sometimes it gets lonely when you're the only one shouting. So it is nice to have a shouting partner. I would love to invite you back again, Jenny, because it has been, as I said, absolutely refreshing. And I wish you all of the best. I thank you for your time. And of course, we will provide all of the information for Jenny below this interview when it airs. I do encourage you anywhere in the maritime industry to get a hold of her because I can guarantee you that there's not a single business within the maritime industry that is doing it all right. And there's a lot of you that are probably doing a lot wrong. You've been listening to Jenny Johnson, founder and CEO of Maritime Inclusion Partners. My name is Rio. I have been your host. We'll see you again next time. Thank you.